Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another episode of Undercurrents. Uh, hey. Oh, we got a great one for you today. Yes, today we're about to have some fun. Uh, it's been very serious here the last couple of shows. We've been, I uh, hope you guys all checked out the show I did with the great Mill Serp. Um, it's getting rave reviews. Even uh, people who don't like me left comments about how much they like the video. So that's a good sign. Well, in today's show, we're going to get those people hating me again. So, <laughs> so let's just get into it, shall we? Uh, thank you to everybody watching. Really appreciate it. Uh, great to see all the old school heads in the crowd over here. And uh, settle back. Get your wig on tight. Light yourself up a joint. <sighs> And we're about to have some fun. <laughs> so, of course, what are we doing today? We are, uh, well, we're just having fun with this whole notion that uh, Berkowitz, David Berkowitz thought Maury Terry was a schmuck. I don't know how much else I can put it. I mean, I've tried the evidence. I've tried using uh, 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 Berkowitz's childhood friends. I've tried to use the police reports. I've tried to use primary sources in Yonkers. And uh, so far, um, Really, uh, it hasn't penetrated the brain of the Maurista. They're still talking about Pilly the artist, and they're still talking about Mr. Real Estate. They're still talking about the spiritually sick Nobel Prize winner Carlton V. Gaju sect, the pederast. They're still talking about John Wheaties' car as if that was actually real. They're talking, of course, about Michael Vale Bar and Dag Charnkowski as Russian nobility, as if that's real. And of course, <laughs> you know what they're doing with each other when it comes to the third member of that triumvirate. They are telling each other that it was indeed Wheat Car driving the yellow Volkswagen away from the Brooklyn scene, almost getting into a crash with Alan Masters and yelling out, Even though that car crash, according to the police reports, um, that car incident took place at five minutes to three, a full 30 minutes after the shooting. It had absolutely nothing to do with David Berkowitz or yellow Volkswagens or the Brooklyn shooting. Total, total ridiculous. Oh, yeah. They're also talking about Scientology. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Michael Vale Carr was a Scientologist, therefore he's guilty. I mean, that's that's the mindset of these people. And of course, we're going to take down one of the biggest Maurice as there is next week. I can't re re wait to do this. We're going to be taking down Jonathan Mitchell's before son of Sam. I mean, after all, this is a guy who has seen fit to slander me publicly uh, going on on Ed Flopperman's show, calling me a liar, saying that I'm aware of the real truth, but that I'm hiding it from the people. But today we're going to be looking at Berkowitz's own words. Like I said, I've tried everything else. Maybe now the Berkowitz's words will, will penetrate these people because let me tell you something. Yeah, I know Berkey has come out and in, 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 when, when Maury died and he wrote a nice little blurb about how Maury was his friend. But when it mattered in 1979 and 1980, when all this cult business started coming around, that's when Berkowitz's true opinion really mattered, and we're going to see it. So let's get started. So, of course, today we're talking about Berkowitz thought Maury was a schmuck. I mean, that's basically <laughs> basically what this has to do with. Here's Berkowitz on the trail. Maury looking at him longingly because they had some sort of weird homoerotic relationship, which we're going to speculate on and deal with. Uh, this was definitely not a normal relationship between these two. This was more like patron and and um young boy uh getting paid by fought by daddy here that's what was going on with these two and of course berkowitz's famous words now as for this cult <laughs> which we'll deal with in a in a few minutes of course right exactly john catalano who was bill manser another person who of course we have totally debunked so, of course, like I said, speaking to primary sources, I thought was going to do the trick, right? I thought that when I spoke to Jim Fay and John Comparetto, John Comparetto was one of Berkowitz's best friends. I thought when I spoke to Maria, a childhood friend of David Berkowitz, 
I thought when I spoke to Jeff Hartenberg, who was a childhood friend of David Berkowitz, I thought when I spoke to John Rinciari, who was in the auxiliaries with Berkowitz, Jim Fay, who was in the auxiliaries and who knew Berkowitz, I thought when I spoke to John Comparetto a second time, one of Berkowitz's best friends, I thought that that would be enough to convince people that maybe like like we 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 were on a different level here and we kind of knew know what we're talking about because again we deal with primary sources. Um, the last time I used any newspaper article to get um, any to glean any information was in the old days. It was in 2021 when I was actually working with the, with <laughs> with the complete moron John Mitchell. Um, I thought he was special needs back then, to be quite honest with you, but I was nice to him. But um, I was very unimpressed by these people. And of course, everything they did was get it out of newspapers. So I uh, so I decided that I was going to start a different a different thing. Uh, so speaking of primary sources, you guys watching, you get it. You got it. You're with me. We've been on this journey together. You know what's up. David Disco Dave did it alone. We know now all about his childhood. And of course, with the uh, Abramson letters, we know more about his motivations, of course, which we'll get into today. But obviously, speaking of primary sources, didn't convince the moron, right? M-A-U-R-O-N. I figured by going up to Yonkers and speaking to people in Yonkers, right? The Untermeyer Park series, amongst other things, the Neto videos, um, speaking to many of Maury Terry's contacts behind the scenes, people who helped him in his investi so-called investigation, up in Yonkers and who gave me copious notes that helped me uh, make sense of this. I, I, you know, I thought that that was going to help and that that was going to actually make people understand and that the person who needs this information the most, the people who are still talking about wheat car as an intelligence asset and the car family as an intelligence asset, they need this information the most. I, I thought that this would help. It didn't. Alas, I thought debunking names from Maury's list would help. OK, now, Maury's list of the 22 actually consists of about 80 people. Roy Cohn's on there, uh, uh, Abe Beam's um, uh, 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 um, friends and, and, and staff is on there. Uh, th there's local people from the neighborhood like Taco Grady and Alfonso Carroza, the guy you see right here. Um, he's named as Wicked King Wicker. He's on the list of the 22. Maury just straight up named this guy. I, I thought debunking names from Maury's list would help. You know, I have a video here. It's 41 minutes. It's about you guys can go check it out. It's uh, we just did this recently where we spoke to this guy's nephew and he's like, what? My uncle was the Wicked King Wicker. He, this guy wanted to sue Maury Terry. I mean, this is ri ridiculous stuff. And of course, we've debunked several names. We've debunked all the Carr brothers and sisters. We debunked Norman Silberstein. We've debunked Taco Grady. We've debunked Alfonso Carroza. Of course, we don't need to debunk Roy Cohn and A. Beam staff because the thought of them being involved with Berkowitz is like, you, you really have to be one of the dumbest people on planet Earth at this point to actually believe this crap. Okay. You know, it's funny. Wheat Car sent me a, a, a message saying, your video yesterday was so great. The one on the guns, that's the kind of videos you should make. You should stay out of uh, out of the fight and out of, uh, you know, and I'm like, Wheat, don't watch today's video because I'm on the warpath. Uh, I'm sick and tired of these of these people and they need to go down and they are going down. I'm taking every one of them down. Jonathan Mitchell's next. Then comes Jim Rothstein. And then we're going to start a, a series on the mentally ill homicide detective Chinati, where we'll listen to some of his tapes and talk about his, his relationship with the absolute lunatic seer of Bayside, uh, Veronica Lucan, and how all that started. It's a different Manny uh, that you're going to see in the next couple of weeks. I'm taking the gloves off. I'm, I'm sick and tired of being uh, uh, accused of things that I've never done. I'm sick and tired of the lies. It's time for me to pay back the people who have screwed me over, but I'm not going to pay you back by being mean to you or insulting. I'm going to pay you back by by bringing you the most devastating, absolutely devastating fact-filled shows that you can ever imagine. It's going to be a tour de force in the next couple of weeks. I hope you guys all, all stick around. 
So, of course, debunking names from Maury's list didn't help. Um, people are still banding about this guy as Alpha, as Wicked King Wicker, and Roy Cohn was part of the Son of Sam cult, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Again, all Rothstonian, bloviating, Galatian uh, windbagism. Um, complete lunacy. Hell, man, I thought the actual evidence would... <laughs> I thought this would actually work. Like, for instance, this is what we do here, right? Like, we have Maury's words right here. He, at the Brooklyn shooting, he's putting, he's talking at about 1.30 a.m., which is half an hour before the, uh, 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 no, I'm sorry, an hour before the shooting. When this guy, Maury Terry, needed to craft a narrative of all sorts of, of, uh, of all sorts of uh, cultists and, and, and gang members and people who were about to shoot Stacy Moskowitz um, surveilling the park and the surrounding area. Maury needed that in order for him to craft his narrative. So here you have 1.30 a.m., a clear, like, guys, I don't know how much more clearer I can put this. I didn't write this 1.30 a.m. This is in The Ultimate Evil. Maury Terry wrote this 1.30 a.m. He put all these people into the narrative at 1.30 a.m., including Mr. and Mrs. Frank Raymond, who were walking their dog on the service road near the overpass. Notice a similar man by a hole in the fence which separates the Parkway Greenbelt from the service road. Seeing the Raymonds look at him, the man ducks behind some shrubbery. All right, so the clear implication is that this was a suspicious guy that everybody was seeing, right? Crossing the Parkway, wearing sunglasses, carrying a brown paper bag. The only problem is I found the police report along with uh, my work, my partner's book club warrior and John Catalano. Here's the Raimondos. Here's their police report, which says this is the police report Maury Terry used to, to it took place at 11 p.m. 2300 hours is 11 p.m. They took their dog. Everything else is the same, right? They took their dog for a walk on Shore Parkway. They observed a male dressed in dungarees and a gray shirt. No sunglasses, by the way. Uh, saw them and went back through the hole. This took place almost four hours, three hours before the shooting. This had nothing whatsoever to do with Maury's narrative, which again, I'm not making this up, guys. This is objective, factual truth here. You have the Maury's words putting the Raymond's thing in at 1.30 a.m., and then you have the actual police report of the Raymondos, the real name, which took place I don't know how to make it any more clearer, guys. Hey, hey, Mitchell, uh, I know you believe that Harry Harnash, the oculist in 1920, was the originator of the Son of Sam cult and that Norman Silberstein was running guns for the cult and that Barry Dosenko was in Brooklyn and all this ridiculous stuff that was imprinted into your mind, like the duckling that you are. But it says here 2,300 hours. If it was 1.30 a.m., it would say 0130, not 2,300. Okay? Like, I don't know how I can make that any more clearer. I've done this, me and John and Book Club have done this literally hundreds of times already, showing you what Maury wrote in the book and then showing you police reports that, show, that clearly indicate that Maury saw these police reports and crafted a narrative to go with his pre-planned narrative, his pre-planned uh, objective, which was he had to prove there was a cult. Therefore, he made it happen by juicing the evidence. But you know what, guys? The actual evidence didn't work. In fact, nobody, the, the moron won't even acknowledge this exists. The Morista, they will not watch the Brooklyn series, the Freud series, the Boscarichian series. And if they do, it's like they still come back to me and say, you're a process member and a liar. Okay, guys, that's just the way it's going to be. I get it. Okay, I'm not even angry about it. I mean, if you want to believe in the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus, and if you want to believe that there's elves in the North Pole making your toys for Christmas, that's fine with me. I have no problem with it, but I choose to live in a world of objective reality. Okay. So I think that we should, in that case, then try a fifth method. This should say fifth, not fourth. <laughs> Sorry. I made, I screwed up that. And that's of course, using Berkowitz's only words. So let's see what Berkowitz had to say about Maury Terry again, when it mattered, when all this this cult business, as Maury, as as Berkowitz put it, was was beginning. So, of course, we start here with the famous letter to D Channel, 
written here in February of 1980, right when Maury Terry was starting to uh, get hot and bothered about uh, David Berkowitz and trying to and trying to write him letters. Here is what Berkowitz wrote to one of his best friends, D Channel, about Maury Terry. I wrote Maury, and again, I'm I'm all, I I I copied this over to here. Um, if anyone doesn't believe that I copied it verbatim, that's fine. You're 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 a total idiot. But I'll just put this on my Facebook so people can see. It just doesn't look very easy to read, right? And so what I'm going to um, what I'm going what I did was I just wrote it here next to it. All right, so I wrote Maury Terry a couple of letters, but I've called it quits with him because he's a pest. In one letter, he asked about 30 questions. These weren't yes or no questions either. Goodness, he wanted a whole book. So I'm just going to ignore him because it's got out and gotten out of hand. I didn't answer his questions either. Piensac still writes from time to time, and he asked when I will let him up here. He wants to visit because of this new investigation. My answer for the last three months was no. So you see, this whole thing was a big pile of confusion anyhow. It was also needless and superfluous. Well, we fought each other over nothing, really. In the end, I just got so mad that I dropped Terry and Piensac both. Yes, you were obviously being used as a stepping stone by these two non-Christian fools. I have to laugh because they were men most ignorant. No, some investigators these guys would have been. I'm sure they would have been dead by now if they went any further. They probably would have froze to death in North Dakota. They're so stupid. Why they probably couldn't tell the difference between a demon and Richard Nixon. So, of course, I want to just let that stew in the mind of the moron. Like, how do you justify this? Um, please tell me in the comments or in the chat. Like, how do you how do you justify this? Here he is saying in 1980 that Maury Terry wrote him a couple of letters. They were huge. He wanted a whole book. That's kind of ironic. <laughs> Berkowitz was... Berkowitz actually knew what the deal was way in advance. He was like, this guy just wants a book. And here he says he's going to ignore him. He writes about how the whole thing was a big pile of confusion anyhow. And he writes about how Terry, let's see, he says that Terry's a non-Christian fool, a man most ignorant, uh, dead by now if they went any further. And of course, that's gonna the moron is going to say, Maury Terry? <sighs> He would have been dead by now if he went any further. That's Berkowitz. That's Berkowitz telling him, telling us that the cult would have killed Maury Terry if he went any further. Uh, no, guys, uh, refer to the next sentence. They probably would have froze to death in North Dakota. Like that, that's what he's referring to, right? That's the death that he's talking about. And of course, he writes, they're so stupid, they couldn't tell the difference between a demon and Richard Nixon. And that, that's actually true because, you know, Maury Terry, before he had the process as the uh, to blame for Son of Sam, he had um, the cosmic police and the way. And it was and the, the process only got involved because some 29 year old guy named Larry Siegel said, hey, the process keeps German shepherds. And there were some German shepherds in Untermeyer Park. So that's the beginning, of course, of what later becomes Jonathan Mitchellism, right? Where like you look in a newspaper and there was a, a, a an eye doctor from 1920 who had an abortion, an illegal abortion. So therefore, he's a member of the Son of Sam cult. I mean, that's literally in Mitchell's book, right? And these are people who are calling us liars, us um that we don't know what we're talking about, that we are compromised, that we have an agenda. Yeah, I have an agenda, you assholes. You know what the agenda is? It's called truth. It's called objective reality. It's called getting the stupid shit out of Son of Sam called this Maury Terry's whale of a theory called the, the cult theory. It's the stupidest shit I've ever heard now that I actually know the evidence. I was there with you at one point. I believed in Mr. Real Estate. I believed in Billy the Artist. I believed that Berkowitz had help. Guys, he was calling Maury Terry a non-Christian fool, ignorant, stupid, dead by now, not good investigators. <laughs> yes, Chris, it means that Richard Nixon was in the process as well. I'm sure that there's some way that they're going to say that. Hold on, what did John write? 
Now they're going to attack my Caparelli's interview with Berkowitz or confess to being a lone shooter is a lie. Right. Exactly. I mean, Berkowitz, Berkowitz is a liar to these people when it's convenient for these people for him to be a liar. Um, Berkowitz only told the truth to Maury Terry, according to the Maury Terry fan. But uh, I'm going to flip that on the, on the script. I'm going to put out publicly right now. I don't think Berkowitz is a liar. I think he has lied. For sure. Okay. We all have. A liar is someone who does it habitually to everybody that he sees. I actually think Berkowitz has been remarkably consistent and truthful for the last 47 years or however long it's been. I think the only outlier is Maury Terry. The only person he actually lied to was Maury Terry because everybody else gets the same story. The demons, he was influenced by the occult, he was in a dark place. And of course, today we're going to look at some of his motivations as well. So, of course, we thank Mike Caparelli, PhD, spiritual counselor, the great Mike Caparelli, for his uh, revolutionary work in Son of Sam. What he did actually dovetailed onto our video series, even though he isn't a fan of our series necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily a friend of ours. But he, his work dovetailed ours. We were the first modern Son of Sam research group to come out and say that the cult didn't exist that Berkowitz worked alone, that I acted alone. And of course, Berkowitz, uh, then two years later, after our video series starts, is uh, meeting with his spiritual counselor, Mike Caparelli, PhD, and admits fully that he completely lied. And we'll talk about that a little later. <laughs> Wheel says, some stamps, envelopes, candy bars, and a six-month subscription of time got Maury the fairy tale he wanted. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, I have my suspicions as to why Berkowitz was uh, was was pre feeling pressure, but let's speculate on that later. But a wheel, I have to say, as a spoiler alert, you ain't wrong, my friend. You ain't wrong. All right, so let's carry it on because we have a little bit more to do. Well, quite a bit more to do, actually. So, of course, Abramson confronts the issue of the uh, of the cult. Right. So this is a letter that Ber this is an excerpt from a letter that Abramson wrote to Berkowitz in 1980. Last but not least, I was glad to see from the newspapers that you would refuse to talk with D.A., the district attorney, about your so-called relationship with John Carr, quote, John Wheaties, unquote. I have previously talked with you about this, and you told me that you never knew John Carr or anyone else of his family. I was curious to see in the newspaper that you were believed to have belonged to a devil worshiping cult. I never heard of it because of your own psychology. I would not believe you could belong to any gang or cult. So of course there's a lot in here, which, which, which is all true. He didn't know John Carr. He didn't, he called him John wheat. Uh, he, he, he admitted to Jack Jones in the killer tape podcast that he did not know the Carr family, uh, in any way, shape or form. I have a call out to the Son of Sam community. Remember the Gilroy deposition in the Ultimate Evil, where Berkowitz is saying um, is saying uh, that he knew John and, and Michael Carr and that they were devil worshippers. Well, I'm putting out the call to the Son of Sam community to hold your horses on that, because I have a sneaky suspicion that if, that if the Gilroy deposition was ever released in full, all of the pages of the Gilroy deposition, which exists somewhere on this planet. I have a sneaky suspicion that we would find that Maury Terry took those passages out of context, put them in the book, and then left out passages out of the Gilroy deposition where Berkowitz says that he didn't know the cars and he had no clue who they were, were and he didn't know Fred Cowan. Again, it's just the speculation that I'm making. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm just guessing this, okay? But I have a, a sneaky suspicion that if the Gilroy deposition was released in full, that somehow or other we would learn more about how Maury Terry lied. And I have a feeling that if there were ever correspondence between Berkowitz and Maury Terry, I'm not saying that it exists, but I have a feeling that if we had correspondence to study as Son of Sam researchers between Maury and Berkey, that we would glean a hell of a lot about their relationship. So anyway, so this is um, Abramson saying, hey, what's up with this shit I'm seeing in the newspaper, dude? You told me you didn't know John Carr. What the hell is going on with this guy, Maury Terry? Well, Berkowitz answers. 
But what's interesting is that remember here in the in the letter to D Terry, D I'm sorry, D Channel, he's like getting pissed at Maury because he, he Maury asked 30 questions and they weren't yes or no questions. He wanted a whole book. Well, what's interesting is that Abramson in this letter where this excerpt is from, dudes, it's a six page letter with 19 questions. Okay. Now check this out. So this should piss off Berkowitz, right? He got pissed off when Maury Terry sent him a list of 30 questions. But look at Berkowitz's reaction. Berkowitz answers these questions fully. Here's his responses. So Berkowitz didn't have any issue with people writing him long letters and asking for uh, for uh, uh, information and, and 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 detailed information, right? After all, let's look at some of the questions in, in Abramson's letter to him. Hard to see because I ca kept these small, but uh, you have also told other psychologists about the building whom you with other dogs and they took a car or whatever. I don't even know what the hell this says. But this is very, very detailed questions, right? Which Berkowitz's answer is fully. I mean, very different from the way that he treated and thought of Maury Terry. So that's an interesting insight right there. And of course, here's Berkowitz's answer, which is the nut meat. Now, as for this cult, <laughs> I am aware of many stories about an accomplice, but this isn't true. And I think it doubtful that Mr. Rubenstein could have told you this. One reason is simply because we never discussed this, although I know that the Queen's district attorney consulted him often for information. Another reason is this. Should I have, only for argument's sake, told him of something like this, then by telling you, he would have violated an extremely confidential attorney-client relationship. So please do not be concerned with rumors. Now, what's interesting is, remember Berkey from the Bronx wasn't supposed to... He, he, Remember Honor? Remember Honor, thy father in the Borelli letter? Look at this. Rumors. It's spelled in the English way. Erroneous with an O-U. Misspelled. Berkowitz always put a U after an O, or he did it quite often. <laughs> Honor, thy father. Does that sound like Berkey from the Bronx to you? Um, yes, Maury, it does, you freaking tool you didn't tell us that in these letters he was writing oh you with rumors and erroneous but anyway um let's parse this out so he says here basically that it isn't true right the story's about an accomplice why would he be denying this if this was all true if this was the 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 information that he wasn't that he was afraid like all right yeah he was afraid okay the cult was going to kill him Okay, I just have a question about that. Why did the cult leave Berkowitz alive and then two years later kill Michael Carr and six to eight months later kill John Carr, but leave the main patsy alive, Berkowitz, to, to sit there and talk to Maury Terry about all this stuff? Um, again, when you apply actual logic to any of this stuff, it falls apart. The more the Maurista isn't capable of logic. I know that the I, I just wonder how they're actually justifying all this stuff. Like this is, these are words that exist on paper and they're remarkably consistent with what he's telling other people. Right? So the, the investigation didn't lead anywhere. As far as I know, it's just like you said, the investigation in Westchester didn't lead anywhere. I assume that it has been discontinued and it probably started because of a series of unrelated coincidences and erroneous information. Now that sounds exactly like. So you see this whole thing was a big pile of confusion anyhow. It was all so needless and superfluous. He's remarkably consistent in what he's telling people. Different people in different letters. So there's Berkowitz's answer, and he gives even more of an elaborate, a little bit of an elaboration. But here he says here on April 27th, 1980, yesterday I told you that I did not tell Mr. Rubenstein anything about this cult business. Now, I just want to talk about sociology for, an, for, for a minute. For those of you who aren't from the 70s and 80s and from not from New York, when a New Yorker, particularly a Bronxite, says something business, this cult business, this monkey business, this something business, they're making fun of it. They're, they're, they're using the word business as a, as sarcastic, 
as making fun of what they're saying. This is like a linguistic thing, which maybe goes over people's heads. But he's saying this cult business, he's poo-pooing it. He's making fun of it here. And also, and as I also told you, District Attorney Santucci from Queens asked to visit with me about the matter. Checking through my files for additional information, I came across this paper which should explain everything. Santucci consulted Rubenstein several times to get him to persuade me to allow a visit with the DA. I informed Mr. Rubenstein that I did not wish a visit, and he thus informed the Queen's DA. So apparently, the only conversation Rubenstein and I had about this cult business is when he asked me if I'd like to talk to Santucci. And of course, here's the paper where Santucci, Seth Rubenstein, counselor at law, all you idiots who think that because my father worked for Rubenstein and you're going to make the connection between Rubenstein, there's no connection to be made. There's a lot of Jewish cats in, in New York City with the last name Rubenstein. Okay, and of course, this is going to Herbert Leifer, assistant DA. Dear Mr. Leifer, David Berkowitz has sent me your letter dated February 8th, 1980. He asked that I advise you that he does not wish to visit with you and Mr. Santucci. So here is Berkowitz being truthful to Abramson about not wanting to be visited by Rubenstein. And here's the proof of that in this notarized letter, a uh, uh, legal letter from a lawyer to a DA saying he doesn't wish to visit with you. Again, remarkable consistency. Berkowitz is not a liar. Berkowitz has lied, but he is not a liar. I am going on record as the first son of Sam researcher to go on record to say that Berkowitz told the truth to everybody except for Maury Terry. And the reason why he did that still needs to be it still needs to be uh, um, discussed. And we'll discuss that at the end of today's show. And of course, we have the Caparelli revelations. Now, I want you guys to show Caparelli some love, buy his book, get the Kindle if you don't if you can't afford a hard copy. So I didn't put in all of the uh, the the um, words here. I want you guys to like read it for yourself. In the chapter called Shocking Confessions, Berkowitz, this just came out. Yo, what's up, Mill, sir? Hey, yo, Mill, our video is going down in Son of Sam history. Like, people are absolutely loving it. We, we got to do more stuff together. The Bob Ross of Firearms videos, super mega talent right here. I did all the shootings. Now, this came out last month. This came out in October of 2023, a month and a half ago. I lied in that 1990s interview. That's the interview with Maury Terry. Okay. He thought Maury Terry was a schmuck. I lied in that 1990s interview. I felt so much pressure from certain entities, Maury Terry. I was in heavy denial. So we'll discuss that a little later. Why don't we now deal with uh, the corollary of this? So, of course, we've just seen that Berkowitz thought Maury Terry was stupid, a non-Christian fool, a man most ignorant, so dumb he couldn't tell a, a, the difference between a demon and Richard Nixon, absolutely man most ignorant, stupidest guy on the planet, would freeze to death in North Dakota because he was a bad investigator. Um, that was Berkowitz's thoughts of Maury Terry. I mean, I, I, I didn't make that up. That's in a letter that I found. Well, actually Paul Hart found that letter and he sent it to me and I, and I, and I put it on the air. I, I didn't make that up. I didn't write that. That was Berkowitz writing it. I don't understand what you want from me. All I'm doing is trying to tell you the story as I see it using the primary evidence. I, I, I didn't show you a newspaper article about that letter. I showed you the actual letter. Now, what you do with that is on your own. Most people who have a, a, a modicum of intelligence who still may be on the cult theory, this will give them pause. This will make them realize, wait, something ain't right. I need to go watch Manny's Brooklyn series. I need to go watch the Catalano series on uh, on Freund and Voskerichian. Uh, uh, also Catalano series on Brooklyn. I need to go look at some of this stuff that may, I need to go look at the Hunter Meyer series. I need to go look at the interviews with Berkowitz's friends from when he was a childhood, where we also talk about Von Mueller, another name from Maury's list of the 22, who he called eggs, who was completely exonerated, had nothing to do with any of this stuff. So I've shown you what Maury, what Berkowitz thought of Maury Terry. It wasn't good. 
he was denying the cult theory. He was saying that it was completely superfluous, erroneous with an OU, and so on and so forth. Well, the corollary of that is, well, let's find out why he did it. Let's find out his motivations. Well, again, here we go. All you have to do is go do some research, guys. Get your head out of the ultimate evil. Stop circle jerking the pipe band. Stop reading newspapers about how there was 22 women in 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 Francis Carr's answering service as if somehow that means something. I used to think that the fact that she had 22 women in the answering service meant something. Yo, 2021 called it once it's research back. Guys, you're two years behind the times. I also used to flush very easily, especially around women in class and in other public settings. I was incapable of handling stress. The barking dogs, the blasting television downstairs, the bills, the car breaking down, the supervisor yelling at me, all of it. I couldn't handle it. I just blew up. Here in prison, I like my job. It's all routine. I can do it without supervision and do it well. There's no pressure here. Now I'm a changed man. I've grown cold as ice, void of emotion and feelings. Hence Dr. Schwartz's statement. The man is emotionally dead. He can't love. He has no feelings for anyone. Life has no value, no worth to him. It's cheap. Thus we have six dead and seven wounded as I raised my gun to their heads, aimed and calmly executed them, their lives snuffed out and delivered back to God with return to sender stamped on their foreheads. Let them return from whence they came, let them return unto their maker, says Berkowitz. Cold blood, a man with a heart of steel. Incapable of compassion is the only person who could have pulled that trigger. Ha ha, I got you back, God. I got my revenge. You took my mother from me, king of kings, you Indian giver. Ha ha, got you back. Payback, payback. Ha ha. I waited so long for the payback. You're cruel. You hurt me. You took away the only ones I ever loved, and now I can love no more. I hate you. I hate, 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 hate you. So here he is talking about the victims as if they're meat, right? Snuffing out, return to sender. From the outset of the 44 shootings, I knew I would be captured one day. It was my goal to be. However, there were many whom I wanted first. All of this would have been pointless if I were never captured. People to know that it was me. Me, I got you back, world. It's me, David, whom you fucked over. Now he uses the word whom. I mean, that shows higher intelligence than normal. Someone perfectly capable of writing the letters, which we've already proven that he's written. We don't need to go through that again. But you're seeing that his motivations for the Son of Sam case were actually very simple. It had nothing to do with being a patsy for the process or, or international chaos using Bill Menser and Barry DeSenko. The guy felt that he was fucked over by God and he wanted revenge against the world. It's really not that hard to deal with or, or hard to understand. Although I was unconscious of it at the time, through a recent period of self-analysis, I finally see why I persistently shot the victims in the head. I didn't want to maim them. Obviously, I wanted to kill them, but not just kill them, obliterate them, totally annihilate them off the face of the earth and out of existence. This was how deep the underlying anger was, the underlying hatred repressed within the deep recesses of my mind for so very long. It came forth in a sudden burst. With the finding of my natural mother, Betty Falco, and many other circumstances beyond my control, such as my rotten environment with all its noise and tension that surrounded me, it was just too much. This was in me for so long, these violent criminal thoughts, that despite the laws of mankind, I had to do it. I wanted to do it. I had to take their lives. I've always been a cautious person. There are people whom I associated with just prior to my capture, peers, family, neighbors, etc. After my arrest, they said, I can't believe he's the killer. Well, if they could have read my mind and seen my thoughts, then they would have known without a doubt that I was the son of Sam. 
So, of course, so that's why Berkowitz did it. Revenge against the world. He was pissed off at his life circumstances. How hard is this to understand, guys? The story of Son of Sam is actually quite mundane. The fun of it comes in making fun of Maury Terry and his stupid cult theory. Other than that, there's really not much more point to what we're doing. I just happen to enjoy making fun of Maury Terry, and so does, and the audience enjoys me listening to it because it's so rich and 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 it's the gift that keeps on giving. But in reality, the story of Son of Sam is mundane. He was the one of the original incel killers, hated his life, hated his environment, got pissed off at the noise, and felt so much pressure he went out and killed. Now, you you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it. This is somewhere where I actually disagree vociferously with my friend Mike Caparelli, PhD, spiritual counselor. I think he buys into the whole anyone could do this horse shit, which I what I call horse shit. Um, it's all in Abramson's letters, Berkowitz's letters about how anyone is capable of what I did. And Susan Sugar, his sis, his cousin in law, says the same thing. Anybody would have could have done what you did. Um, maybe one day I'll have a debate with Caparelli about that. I don't personally buy it, but if he can convince me, I'm 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 all ears. So we just learned how, why Berkowitz did it, the pressure, the noise, the generally deteriorating um, mental uh, st status. We know now what he thought about M Maury Terry, he thought he was a schmuck, an ignorant fool, so stupid, terrible investigator, a pest. And again, I didn't make any of this information up, guys. Like That's what's being accused of me, and that's fine if you want to believe that. I know you also believe that Quasimodo was delivering kids to the UN because Rothstein was in a uh, was in a, uh, a, a an office one day and some captain wrote something on a piece of paper and then burned the piece of paper that said Quasimodo looks like uh, Quasimodo was supplying kids to the U. I mean, if you want to believe that and Roy Cohn bearing three kids and Berkowitz knowing all of the entire gay underground of the nightclub scene in New York and Studio 54 and all that. That's all well and good, but here Berkowitz is telling you he's basically a loser who had <laughs> who had nothing in life going on. So that's why he did it. Now let's learn how he did it, because again, it's a visceral thing. Um, this is a guy who supposedly didn't do all the shootings, yet the night of the shootings confessed in great detail to them. He knew only things that the cops knew. He knew forensically things that only the policemen knew. Now, I know what the Maury Terry fans say. He was debriefed. The process got their patsy in a room, and instead of killing him, which would have made the most sense, they debriefed him on how to uh, confess to the cops. They said, okay, you didn't, you did everything except for, you did, no, you did Loria and you did Suriani Esau. The Bronx was your territory. So now Berkowitz, our patsy, who we're going to leave alive um, to go to the, to get arrested, uh, but yet, Six months later, we're going to kill John Carr, who was not involved in this in any way. And two years later, we're going to kill Michael Carr. Wheat Carr somehow was left alive all of these years, as well as Sam and Francis, who died of natural causes in the 90s. Uh, the international Satanists and, 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 and uh, uh, intelligence agents through their answering service. Um, yes, Berkowitz. So now what we're going to do before your capture, where we're going to leave you alive, even though we should kill you, um, we're, we're now going to debrief you on all the shootings. So here's what happened in Moskowitz. Here's what happened in Lori and, Fro and, and Freund. Here's what happened in Voskerici. And here's what happened in Lomino de Masi. Here's what happened in Denaro. You did everything else, so you'll know those. But we're going to give you all the information for the other ones. And so, of course, when did this debriefing take place? Who was at this debriefing? Where did it take place? How did it take place? Was it over the phone? Was it in person? When did it take place? We know why it took place. <laughs> this debriefing of Berkowitz to get all the information about the shootings that he would tell the cops when he was arrested. But these letters were written two years later. These letters were written in 1979 and 1980, okay, two years after he was arrested. So he, Berkowitz must have had the greatest memory in the world because here he is talking about the shootings again in great detail. All of the shootings were between several minutes to an hour. Yes, the first was 20 minutes. This time was spent stalking and watching. I walked around the block several times. I checked out alleyways. I looked up to windows of all the apartment buildings to see if anyone was looking out, but I was secretly hoping they'd drive away. 
The second shooting, Denaro and Keenan, Flushing Queens, about 10 minutes. I could have waited longer, but I was anxious. I wanted to get it over with and then head home. Third one, Demasi and Lomino, Floral Park, Queens, within five minutes. I saw them on the porch, drove to my car around the corner and parked it. I then got out, walked directly to the porch up the street and fired. Fourth, Freund and Deal, Forest Hills. I saw them get into the car and I walked up the street. I walked several hundred feet, turned around. Yo, Catalano, you with me on this? Check this out. This is exactly what we speculated in our video. I walked several hundred feet, turned around, and headed back to the car they were seated in with the engine running. I aimed and fired. This took about five minutes. Fifth shooting, Boscarici in Forest Hills. I walked around for a long time, just walking and thinking. By the way, all of which is reflected in the police reports that have reports of, of suspicious men in the neighborhood walking around. I spotted this girl walking up the street. I raised my gun and shot her once. This only took seconds, but during that evening, I had passed dozens of potential victims. I don't know why I chose her. I could hardly make out her facial features in the darkness. However, I was on the street for several hours, just walking, thinking, and prowling. Now that I look back on this, none of it makes any sense. 6-1, Suriani and Esau, male and female. This time I again had been cruising for hours, about six hours. I was headed up towards Yonkers along the Hutchinson River Parkway service road when I saw two heads over the seat of the car as I approached from behind. I then drove my car around the corner and parked. I walked towards the car, dropped a note at the scene, then opened fire. Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau died. Seventh, Placido and Lupo, Bayside, Queens. Again, I had been walking and staking out the area for hours. I saw them and just finally decided that I must do it and get it over with. But believe it or not, I had no real desire to keep at this. Yet I did. Both were wounded. Eighth, Moskowitz and Violante, Brooklyn. You know this one. Besides, I'm tired. Let me add that I will not describe this again. I will not give you any further detailed accounts of my crimes. Well, he did give detailed accounts. Here he is talking about Moskowitz. I remember my last shooting in which Stacy Moskowitz was slain. I saw her and her boyfriend making out in the car. Then they left the car, walked over the walk bridge, and went along the path by the water. After about 20 minutes, they returned to the car, made out some more, then came to where I was, by the swings. I watched Stacy on the swing, and then she stopped swinging. Her and her date then started to kiss passionately for several minutes. At this time, I too was sexually aroused. I had an erection. Shortly after their deep kissing, they went back to the car. If my memory is correct, they made out a little more and then just sat inside the car talking. Now I then quietly crept up alongside the car, but a little more to the rear. I had my gun out, aimed it at the middle of Stacy's head, and fired. One bullet struck her and another nicked her. I didn't even know she was shot because she didn't say anything, nor did she move. Then I got in my car and drove off. By the way, all of this is reflected in the police reports. This is exactly how it went down, according to Violante. Even the whole deal with her not speaking. Violante said the same thing in his, in his reports. So Berkowitz, in, in 612 of 1980, almost three years after the shooting, He's remembering details that were in the police reports, but again, he didn't do this shooting, right? Who told him about this? Where, who was he debriefed him, right? Now, I'm just being, I'm just kidding. I'm being facetious. In order to believe the cult theory, you have to basically suspend all laws of physics and nature, <laughs> right? And Derek Larson, but what about the grubby hippie? <laughs> yes, is my man, Derek, on point. And of course, those of you in the moron crowd, I did a, uh, me and Catalano did a show on the grubby hippie hoax. There was no mention of a grubby hippie anywhere in the police reports. In fact, Violante describes Berkowitz almost to a T. I've always wondered if some of the victims were having sex in their cars. I'm trying to remember if Esau and Suriani were having sex. I know they were embracing, but I can't remember if they had their clothes off or not. If they did have their clothing off and were engaged in sex, then I would be somewhat justified in killing them. Sex outside of marriage is a heinous sin. Alexander Esau, Valentina Suriani, Hutchinson River Parkway. And of course, here he is talking about the, uh, uh, he didn't mention it before, but here he is talking in great detail about the Loria killing. 
With regards to the Moskowitz shooting, I wrote you a letter the other day describing that one. Now I will tell you about the first one, Donna Loria. I saw her and another girl sitting in a blue Oldsmobile Cutlass as I drove past. I parked about two very short blocks away on a side street. Co coincidentally, there was a space available. I left my car walking in the direction of their parked car. I saw both girls sitting there, apparently talking. I circled the car at a distance like an animal stalking its prey. Cautiously, I was watching for movement from other people in the street. However, there was none. Then, from behind and on the sidewalk, I approached the car, took my revolver out of a paper bag, and stopped parallel to their vehicle. I faced Donna, aimed my gun in the general direction, and fired all five rounds very rapidly. I saw the glass breaking into small slivers. The horn started sounding loudly, and then I ran full speed in the direction of my car. I stopped running within 50 feet of the car, then started walking briskly to it. I got in and then drove off. I aroused no attention. I didn't know I had killed her until I read the post the following afternoon. The shooting took place about 1 a.m. I went straight home and went to bed. I got up early the next day to go to work at the cab company in the same neighborhood, Pelham Bay Park. I was at work promptly at 6.45 a.m. That day, I made out better than usual in both tips and fares. I made it my point to go to work so I wouldn't arouse any suspicion. But who would have suspected me anyway? I didn't know the victims. So, of course, uh, there's people out there doing so-called research, trying to connect the victims to, to, uh, to each other. Guys, you'll be doing this till the day you die. The victims didn't know each other. The only interesting connections was in the Bronx here because the shootings took place in such a localized area of the Bronx and because those neighborhoods were so close knit. And again, you only see this on my channel because we're the ones that deal with the sociology of this. The Bronx crew around Valentina Suriani, they knew Donna Loria and they knew Judy Placido. And that's only because, again, of the simple fact of where Berkowitz chose to shot these people, shoot these people. And, and in the case of the Eliphas disco, it was just a coincidence that he shot Judy Placido, who happened to live in that same neighborhood. That could have gone either way. But that's the only place where there was any uh, uh, knowledge of the victims to each other. And even then, they weren't really friends with each other. Just everybody kind of knew who each other was. Uh, but there were definitely connections. Um, we learned from Gloria Kalili that her brother worked with Donna Loria's brother and so on and so forth. Um, but unless you want to say these people were into in, in the, the process, I can't see how you make any conclusions with this. So our last slide. Yeah, so a Will says here, uh, yeah, on point, him saying cult business is Berkey straight shitting on that idea. Totally. It's a, it's a Bronx saying. It's a New York City saying. They don't say it much anymore. It was more of a 70s saying. But uh, for sure, uh, a Will, you, you're on point with that. Um, just looking to see if there's any uh, other things here in the chat here. Nothing that I really need to deal with. So let's deal with our last slide. So, of course, the final frontier, the last frontier to the real cult story. And what do I mean by that? The story of the Maury Terry cult. All right. The only cult that exists in Son of Sam now are the cultists who actually believe the liar, the drunkard, the wig wearer, the chain smoker, the not good friend, the guy who decides to send you 1500 feet direction that way when he's supposed to go 1500 feet the direction this way. The guy who lied to his best friend, more uh, uh, Carl Denaro, who, 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 who Carl Denaro only found out after the death of this of this guy right here how badly he was screwed over by him yet carl denaro still carries water for this guy and still to this day is putting out the horse shit that berkowitz didn't shoot him it's actually embarrassing <laughs> it's really embarrassing actually at this point but this is the last frontier to the real cult story what was the deal between these two they don't look like i mean this isn't right here sorry if I'm ever lucky enough to meet Berkowitz, I'm not going to be taking a picture with him to show you. I'm not going to be sitting there, you know, Maury Terry, he's smiling here. He's smiling next to next to his friend David Berkowitz. I mean, this doesn't look right to me. There's something going on here. So in my opinion, the last frontier to the real cult story lies in this statement in Caparelli's book. I lied in that 1990s interview. I felt so much pressure from certain entities, 
I was in heavy denial. So here I'm going to go into speculation land. Okay. I'm not going to be dealing with, uh, with factual stuff that I know for sure that I can show you, but I'm going to speculate. And here's my, my speculation. I have a sneaky suspicion. I don't know where this comes from, this suspicion of mine. I don't know how it got into my head. And I don't know why I think this. But I have a sneaky suspicion that Maury Terry was patronizing David Berkowitz. I have a weird feeling about this. And maybe one day I'll be able to prove it. If I'm lucky enough, I have a feeling I'm going to be vindicated on this one day. I have a feeling that there exists somewhere, some record of Maury Terry buying David Berkowitz prison commissary. I'm even going to make a wild speculative guess. I bet you Maury Terry even bought him a new typewriter. I bet Maury Terry was helping out Nat Berkowitz. I bet you Maury Terry was helping Berkowitz communicate with people on the outside. I bet you Maury Terry was doing favors for Berkowitz, including monetary favors in order to what? Put pressure on him to lie in the 1990s interview. I would love to know the backstory of the inside edition interviews, what Berkowitz actually felt about those interviews. Somehow I have a feeling he was blindsided at those interviews and he didn't know what was really coming. And that Maury Terry, just basically in his leading leading of the witness, fashioned a narrative to which Berkowitz agreed to because he felt pressure from certain entities to lie in those interviews. So maybe one day I will be vindicated on that. I hope that I am. I'm putting out there right now the speculation. This is simply speculation. I have no proof of this. But that Berkowitz was paid by Maury Terry. I think that that's the last frontier to the final the final uh, frontier to the real cult story here. I have a feeling that if we read the Gilroy deposition that we would get a lot more information about how Maury Terry manipulated that. I would love to see this stuff, but alas, I don't have access to it, at least not now. So anyway, guys, I hope you're all doing well out there. We're going to be taking a few days off while uh, Catalano and I prepare the devastating takedown of uh, Jonathan Mitchell's ridiculous piece of crap book called Before Son of Sam. I mean, this is a guy who went on Flopperman's show and basically slandered me, said that I know the truth that I'm covering up that I'm a process member, that I'm compromised, that I really know this true story about the process, but that I'm keeping it from everybody. Oh, we'll see about that, Mitchell. We'll see about that. All right, guys. So anyway, I want to say thank you, everyone, for your attention. This was a fun little show. The next few shows, we're on the warpath. Some people need to be taken down. And they're going to be taken down and they're going to be taken down in such a devastating way that you will not know what hit you. All right, guys, take care. We'll see you soon.